This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, it's time for another Virology 101. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and across the desk from me is the handsome Dick Dixon de Pommier. <laughs> Thanks for that plug, Vince. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not a comedian, you know. He's, he's not wearing his glasses. I just wanted everybody <laughs> to know that he's he's got his glasses off. How are you, Dick? Um, chipper, but I'm a little bit throaty. I'm uh, recovering from some kind of a bug. Uh, this show will air in January of 2010. Wow. Which At which time Dixon will be in Argentina. Looking, See. looking for new viruses, no doubt. <laughs> Hardly. I hear it's summer there at the moment. It's their equivalent to July here. Why Why would you go there in the middle of winter? Well, there are these swimming things we call trout. Oh, you're going to fish? Oh. That's the whole point. That's part of it. The other part is to look at glaciers before they all disappear. They have glaciers and, uh, in Argentina? They have tons of them. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, if you go down far, far enough south, there's a whole glacier area. Are you going to photograph? You bet. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. We look forward to seeing the results of that. By the way, there's a connection between today's topic and fly fishing, which we will get to. Well, you, sh you should point it out. Uh, that's great. This is Virology 101 Continued. And let me just... So we've done a, a number of episodes on classification, structure, entry. We did RNA synthesis last time. We did. And in case listeners are wondering where this is headed... We're going to, in the next in 2010, the next year, go through all the steps of the replication cycle, and then we'll start looking at pathogenesis. Or budding. We have to do budding. We will do assembly, exodus. absolutely, exit. We will do pathogenesis, immune responses. We'll do antivirals and vaccines, and that should bring us through the fall. Wow. And then we'll start doing individual viruses. Wonderful. And that'll take us on for years and years. I think. All right. Absolutely. And so in your retirement, you will continue to teach and learn. I didn't retire. I just changed jobs. <laughs> you know what I did this past? I shouldn't. Hey, this is TWIV. I got confused. That, that, that's okay, Vince. <laughs> I did an influenza plaque assay this week. Uh -huh. The first since I was a graduate student. Did it, it work out it right? It worked, yeah. Really? I, I plaqued out. I, I pulled a vial. This is actually funny. It's a 1930-ish uh, H1N1 strain, which I'd had in my freezer since I was a student. I brought it with me all over. We don't. I pulled it out. <coughs> We're going to have that. No problem. Do you have a uh, common cold or influenza? I believe it's a common cold. Just I get focus these. in the upper tract. No, uh, it's pretty far down, actually. It's, it's, it's down in the lumbar region, but um, it's a typical winter thing for me. I get one of these every other year. Okay. Anyway, so it was uh, an old vial. I put it in cells. It grew. I plaqued it. It's high titer. It's amazing. They last a long time. <sighs> but of course, it's in a minus 70 centigrade freezer. Still. Do you, do you store parasites at minus 70? You can. Did, was it necessary to keep them for long periods? Um, it, it, sure. I mean, if you want to work with them in the lab and you want them available at all times without having to maintain them in, in uh, their mammalian hosts. You store them. Yeah, that's what we do with viruses. And, of course, cells we freeze even lower. But the parasites being multicellular or at least unicellular, you have to protect against ice crystal formation. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of agents that you have to use with them. Same with eukaryotic cells. You have yeah, to yeah. put... Uh, that's right. We use DMSO, yep. uh, 10%, I think. Right. All right, let's get on to today, Virology 101. What I wanted to talk about today is, is sort of an extension of last time. Last time we talked about RNA synthesis in mm -hmm. cells infected with RNA viruses. Correct. And that was going from RNA to RNA. Here we have a group of viruses that go from RNA to DNA. Hmm. More as we'll see. So it was sort of a reverse. <laughs> <laughs> reverse what? Transcription. Exactly. <laughs> Do you know when this story actually... So we're going to talk about reverse transcription today. Do you know when this story, modern times, begins? Not modern, but when does it begin, virologically speaking? I don't have a clue. In the early 1900s, the first uh, cancer viruses were discovered. Hmm. 1908, chicken sure. leukemia virus sure, 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 sure. by Bang and another individual whose name is escaping me. And the 1911, Rouse sarcoma right. virus. I saw the original tumor, by the way. You did? I did. Was I was at Rockefeller for three years, and there was a guy there studying with Rouse mm -hmm. the year I got there. And he said, do you want to see the original chicken tumor that the New Jersey chicken farmer brought to us? I said, sure. And he showed me the pathological slide with the tumor on it. 
Wow, they preserved it. Oh, it's a slide. It's okay. a slide. So yes, what he did was take a tumor, grind it up, and, and filter it through a 0.2 micron filter. Right. And the viruses would go through all the bacteria and cells. Would it be was removed. a filterable agent. It was a filterable agent. He injected it into chickens and showed that they gave them sarcomas, which is a solid, a type of solid tumor. Yes. And so that that was those were the first. There was also one a few years earlier that caused leukemia in chickens, which is of course a cancer of the the white blood cells. Right. And those were the first tumor viruses. So they were called tumor viruses. Then there was a mammary tumor virus too, right? Yes, then mammary Charlotte tumor Friend. virus and, and mice and many others over the years. Yep. But never, not for a long time, human ones. But we'll get to that in another show. Sure. Then when we understood that these viruses that had RNA in them, we called them RNA tumor viruses. Right. Now, this brings us to the early 70s mm -hmm. when two different investigators were trying to understand how these viruses worked. There was some evidence that these, the genetic information of these RNA tumor viruses became a permanent part of the cell. Huh. And Howard Temin at the University of Wisconsin and David Baltimore, right. who at the time was at MIT, Temin actually proposed that the RNA became integrated into the host DNA in a DNA form. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Quite mysterious. Very different. And so there was actually some precedent for that. Do you know what that might be? From no. the world of bacteria. Ah, okay. Plasmids. Lambda DNA. Okay. Integrating into the host okay. DNA. So, in fact, Alan Campbell was essential in this line of work. He showed genetically that the phage DNA of bacteriophage lambda, this is a virus that infects bacteria, it's a linear double-stranded DNA. It can at times circularize, you can see here in this right, next picture. Right. And then that will integrate by a specific site into the bacterial chromosome. Somebody made here. a lot of money on that. <laughs> Is that true? That was one of the vehicles for getting well, other pieces of DNA sure. into the uh, genome. So this goes into bacterial DNA. This was done, this was shown genetically. Not biochemically, Got it. not by cloning, right. just by genetic. Right. And in fact, we talked about this with Lynn Enquist a few, a number of twibs ago. Uh -huh. you might want to take a look at that. And so Temin said, hmm, there is precedent in bacteria for integration. He said, I bet that these tumor viruses, these RNA tumor viruses, make a DNA copy and then they integrate. Sounds reasonable. Cell. Okay, so he tried to show the presence of tumor virus DNA in, in the host cell DNA, and that was really hard to do. Okay. To make sure that it, you don't have any remnant virus particles. See, nowadays we could just sequence it. We'd find it. Yeah, there. that's right. That's right. But back then they were using techniques involving radioactivity and hybridization. Very difficult to. And do what on it. sucrose gradients or cesium chloride gradients? Um, to, I don't even remember what they were doing. Right. But they couldn't get good evidence for it. And yeah. then he and Baltimore at the same time had the idea that there must be an enzyme in the virion that converts the tumor virus RNA into DNA. Hmm. So they looked for it. Now, if you remember last time, we were talking about David Baltimore's early work with RNA viruses. He right. would infect cells, crack them open, yep. add radioactive precursors, and show that RNA was made. Right. So he said, hmm, I could use the same technology, take RNA tumor virions, crack them open, add the precursors to DNA synthesis, which would be ATP, TTP, CTP, and GTP, the nucleoside, deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates, and look for incorporation into radioactive material. So he and Temin had this idea at the same time, and it both worked. They both yeah. worked. And guess what? <laughs> it was pub they were published actually back-to-back -back in Nature in 1970. And Dick, I happen to have them right here, <laughs> just fortuitously. They were back-to-back. -back. Baltimore's paper was just him as an author. A single author paper? Just David Baltimore. RNA-dependent R DNA polymerase in virions of RNA tumor viruses. Wow. It's actually instructive to read this first paragraph. DNA seems to have a critical role in the multiplication and transforming ability of RNA tumor viruses. Infection and transformation by these viruses can be prevented by inhibitors of DNA synthesis. That was a clue. The necessary DNA seems to involve the production of DNA which is genetically specific for the virus. Although hybridization studies intended to demonstrate virus-specific DNA have been inconclusive. That was mm -hmm. what I was referring mm -hmm. to. Right. Also, the formation of virions 
by the RNA tumor viruses is sensitive to actinomycin D and therefore seems to involve DNA-dependent RNA synthesis. Here, here. One model which explains these data postulates the transfer of information of the infecting RNA to a DNA copy, which then serves as template for the synthesis of viral RNA. So he did very few simple experiments in this paper. In fact, I was a postdoc with David Baltimore from 1979 to 1982. And when I got there, there were still some people left over from this era. And they said he went into the lab for six weeks, he did a few experiments, and he got the results. And Nailed was, it. And then he never went back into the lab again <laughs> after that because he got the Nobel Prize. He and Temin got the Nobel There's he, the he, flight. And Te, he and Temin got the Nobel Prize in 1975 for this work. And they didn't have to do any experiments <laughs> themselves again. And I, we should say the second paper is by Temin. And let's see the second author, Tower Temin and Satoshi Mizutani in, in, in Wisconsin. The same idea, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase in virions of Rouse sarcoma virus. Rouse sarcoma virus. 1970. And here, both of these papers back-to-back, -back, there's a little paragraph in front of the two papers, which was written by someone at Nature. It says, two independent groups of investigators have found evidence of an enzyme in virions of RNA tumor viruses, which synthesizes DNA from an RNA template. This discovery, if upheld, will have important implications not only for <laughs> carcinogenesis by RNA viruses, but also for the general understanding of genetic transcription. Apparently, the classical process of information transfer from DNA to RNA can be inverted. What does that mean? So, you know, the old... Dogma yeah, yeah, yeah. was DNA to RNA to protein. Right. So this seemed to go against that. Right. It was a huge revolution in the way we think. Right. So this is now a retrograde flow, right, from RNA to DNA. So that's why they called them Retro retroviruses, viruses. and they called the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Right. Because it copied in the opposite direction. Yep. Yep. Of course, if these had been discovered first... It would have, they wouldn't have been called reverse. That's right. Everything else would have been That's called right. reverse. But they weren't. So here's my fly fishing connection. Mm -hmm. David Baltimore is a world-famous virologist. Yes. He's a world-famous innovator and thinker, and he's a magnificent, accomplished fly fisherman. Is he? He is. As good as you? I've never fished with him, so I can't honestly say. Mm. Does and he tie his own flies? I think he does, actually. Well. What I know, one of my dear friends who's fished with him claims that he's a very accomplished fisherman, so I take his word for it. Interesting. So what, what that means is that he's got an eye for detail no matter what he does. That's what the characteristic of a fly fisherman. <laughs> I think that's true, by the way. I mean, I think we're attracted to the details of how things work because in order to be a good fly fisherman, you have to pay attention to nature at all the levels. Yeah, and, sure. and here's just another example of nature at all levels. You can't have a closed mind and be a good fly fisherman. And David Baltimore obviously doesn't have a closed mind because the dogma of the day suggested that he was barking up the wrong tree. Excuse the dogma and barking up the wrong tree analogy, but that just yeah, seems to work here. And he said, the hell with it. I'm going to just pursue this because it has to be... The data will will tell me whether or not it's true, not the dogma. Yeah, no, no, it's true. You have to have an open mind. In fact, many people didn't like this idea, as you probably remember. Too bad. <laughs> How can you not like a truth? This is 1970. Where were you in your career? At 70, I was uh, transferring from the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo to Columbia University. As a faculty member. Yep. So you remember this. There's a lot of... I not only remember it, but I actually knew David vaguely while he was at Rockefeller as a graduate student in 1967. So he, he has a yeah. reputation that goes all the way back. So to yeah, him. he was a graduate student at Rockefeller, and he went on the, to the West Coast for a while to right. postdoc. Spent Stanford. some time at Einstein, Einstein as well, and then came to MIT as a faculty, and uh, that's where he did these experiments. Right. Five years later, Nobel Prize. Yep. This helped us understand cancer. It helps us understand how retroviruses persist, and yes. reverse transcriptase became an indispensable tool in molecular biology for cloning genes. How about that? Being able to take an RNA and convert it to a DNA copy and put it in a bacterial plasmid. That's what I did as a postdoc. I took polio RNA, I right. used reverse transcriptase and made a DNA copy of it, cloned it into a bacterial plasmid, which gave me lots and lots of DNA, sequenced it, and showed that when you put it back in cells, it was infectious. So it was all using this technology. Bingo. And today, this has spawned the biotechnology industry. Sure. This is awesome.
Now, Howard Temin is no longer with us, but he had a long career of great contributions to retrovirology. Sure. Unfortunately, he died of lung cancer, and he never smoked a day in his life. She was. Very rare. David is still with us. Wasn't he, Howard Temin in charge of the Howard Hughes for a while? No, he wasn't. That was, I'm was sorry. not him. Uh, David Baltimore it currently is at California Institute of Technology. Huh. Where he is a professor, and he has a laboratory still working. Hmm. On science. This episode of TWIV is sponsored by Data Robotics Incorporated, the makers of Drobo. We're really happy to have Data Robotics as a sponsor of TWIV because I've used their product for a number of years now and I use it every day. Drobo is a backup solution which works with any computer and it is a small black box which opens very nicely from the front and into which you can slide very easily hard drives. And in the smallest Drobo, you can put in four hard drives and they make a larger one that will hold eight. Now I have two of the units that will hold four hard drives each and I originally bought my first one a few years ago because I needed a way to securely store all of my photos, my movies from iTunes, music, TV shows and lots of other files that were becoming quite a headache to back up. And just a few months ago, I bought my second unit. And the way I use these is I put in whatever hard drives I have around. I have piles of hard drives from previous backups. I put them in. And then as the unit fills up, I put hard drives in of bigger and bigger sizes. So I started with my original Drobo with four 250 gigabyte hard drives. And then as it filled up, I bought bigger ones. I next bought a 500, then a 750, and now I'm up to one terabyte hard drives, which can be bought for about $80 each. One of the great things about the Drobo is that all of your data are protected. So, for example, if one of the drives fails, you just pull the drive out and replace it with a new one. All of the data are replaced. And that's because anything that you copy onto the Drobo is made redundant across all the drives. So losing one drive, you will never lose any data. That gives you confidence that your data is protected. I have had failures on both of my drive failures on both of my Drobos, the first one and the second one. And the one thing you will know, or the one thing you should know, is that all drives will fail at one time or another. Drobo has a series of lights across the front which tell you the status of the drive and when of each drive. And when they're red, that means the drive is failing or has failed, and you simply need to replace it. I don't have any Drobos in my laboratory, but I'm planning to purchase one in the coming months because it's the perfect solution for storing all kinds of laboratory data. Now, in my laboratory, everyone has their own computer, and everyone stores their own protocols, data on that computer. And we do have a backup, but there is a problem with fragmentation. And you know, I plan to have a single Drobo, which you can put on your network and share among all the computers used by the individuals in my laboratory. And so all the protocols, all the data, or the sequence information, any material related to our research can be stored uh, so that everyone can access it. And not only will it be accessible, but it's secure. The data are secure because, again, if any one drive fails, you can replace it and the data will be restored. So I plan to get one of these for my laboratory and, and I highly recommend anyone with a laboratory of any sort that generates computer data to consider purchasing a Drobo because in that way you can have everyone have access to the data and it is protected. Now we in my department here we've had a Apple RAID array for about 10 years now and this backs up our data every night on everyone's computer in the entire department of faculty of about 15. Uh, a few months ago, one of the drives failed, and it was a complete headache to replace it. And so we've all decided that once that RAID array dies, which will happen soon, it's going to be replaced by a Drobo. And I can tell you that that RAID array cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And the Drobo solution is far less costly, requires zero maintenance. As part of their support for This Week in Virology, uh, Drobo is offering special pricing to listeners of TWIV. If you'd like to purchase a 
Drobo or a Drobo S, you can go to drobostore.com and use the promotional code VINCENT, V-I-N-C-E-N-T, in all capital letters, and you'll get $50 off a Drobo or $100 off a Drobo S. And you can see the difference between those two models at drobo.com. And you can buy the units without drives and supply the drives yourselves, or you can buy the units with drives through Drobo. So once again, to purchase a Drobo, drobostore.com, use the promotion code V-I-N-C-E-N-T, all uppercase letters. This offer is good until March 31st, 2010, North America only. And if others outside of North America would like to partake, let us know, and Drobo can work out something. Drobo is a great product. I'm really happy to have their support. And of course, we thank Data Robotics for their support of This Week in Virology. But this is the entree to today, and today we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, enzyme reverse transcriptase and a couple of other viruses and other places in the world where you would find reverse transcriptase. Very interesting, Dick. I'm riveted. All right, so what's in a RNA tumor virus is there is an RNA genome, and it is about 8, 9 kilobases and 10 kilobases in length or longer, depending on the virus. Right. But there are two copies of that RNA. And it's a plus-stranded RNA, by the way, Dick. Got it. And there are two copies. And why are there two copies? Well, as you will see, these two copies are not both converted into DNA, which, which goes into the cell. But the idea is that if there are mistakes in these RNAs, that one can be used to fix the other. So it's if one has sinister. a deletion, if one has a deletion, the other copy can be used to supply the missing information and so forth. These are the evil twins. <laughs> so they're pseudo diploid because if <laughs> they were diploid, both RNAs would go to a DNA copy which right. would integrate into the cell, but they don't. There's only one integration event. So it's pr the idea is that they're used for a backup. Anyway, there are two copies. They're plus stranded RNAs. Now, Dick. So wait, 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 I want to stop here. Of for course, of course. So this virus now enters the cell. The capsid is released from, uh, the, the RNA is released from the capsid. There are two identical strands sitting in the cytoplasm of the host cell. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, which one goes? Well, the thing is never released from the capsid. As it's... it comes in the cell, it remains associated with a structure, oh. which is called the reverse transcription complex in the cytoplasm. Uh -huh. And probably... Parts of both are transcribed into DNA during the whole phase, nice. not, not any one. So you don't have to make a choice, which is good. <laughs> right. But, Dick, remember last time we talked about plus-strand RNA viruses? I do, I do, I do. And those viruses are plus-stranded, so the RNA can be translated as soon as it gets in the cell. Yep, jump starts. This is not translated ever, this RNA genome of retroviruses is never. It's the exception to the rule. And what stops the translation of that? Good question. Probably partially it remains associated in this subcapsid structure and doesn't I have see. access to ribosomes. So there's a little machinery associated with this. That... It's also coated with protein, a protein called nuclear capsid. So I have another question. Yeah. Then, of course, then what happens when you introduce naked plus stranded reverse <laughs> viral, DNA, viral RNA with only one strand? You can do that artificially. Yes, it, it does. Ooh, that's a good question, Dick. Does it lead to DNA synthesis? Let's look it up. Really? I've asked a question you've got to look I've up? Asked, I've been asked that before, and I've answered it, and now I can't remember. Probably has a complicated answer. No, it's not. It's because if you put that in the cell, that RNA, it could be translated. Or in a cell-free extract. It can be translated, but so let's see. I do believe there is a chapter. Where and Vince is just... looking it up, of course, in this <laughs> book that he wrote, which is you know, it's funny. We all write books, and we sometimes don't remember where we wrote that. And so Vince is now busy studying in the section on questions often asked of me and for which I have no answers. <laughs> this is a very good question. That's why we have you here, to ask good you questions. Think, well, I mean, if you, if you propose the following conditions under which this virus replicates, then okay. you try to break it down to see if you can simplify the process to find think, out what the elements are. So the answer are. is yes, it is infectious. It is infectious. So a DNA copy of uh, a retroviral genome is infectious. So if you put this RNA genome into a plasmid as a DNA copy and you put the DNA in, it's infectious. So 
cloned copies of retroviral genomes are infectious. So I would guess that the, the RNA would also be infectious. Now the question translate. is, both strands, you have both strands, you can separate them. Can you separate those strands? From the, in the virion? I think that would be very hard because, because they're, they're identical. Uh, almost identical, yeah. So what if you labeled one with something that you could later on remove, but which would allow you to separate them first? All right, and then... And then see whether either one could form an infection. I think that they could. It's just that the efficiency would be lower because the other wouldn't be present to complement. I'm just trying to come to grips with why this particular virus has evolved a complicated strategy for success. It's a great idea. It's a great question. And in fact, here in the chapter... I mean, and it causes cancer, as a matter of fact, and unregulated cell well, multiplication. I'm, I'm not sure that that is, is part of this reverse transcription. I mean, I think integration into the cell is part of it, but having right. two genomes... Right. Listen to this. Despite the fact that two genomes are encapsulated, only one integrated copy of viral DNA is detected after infection. Why should such a feature have been selected during evolution? One popular notion is that the availability of two RNA templates can help retroviruses survive extensive damage to their genomes. At least parts of both genomes can and typically are used as templates during the reverse transcription process. So they're both used, but not... Well, why isn't that same logic applied to other viruses that only have single-stranded DNA, or RNA, rather? Uh, the they're only less answer, successful? No, I don't think so. I think there are many ways to skin a cat. Pardon, sure. pardon the no, metaphor. You're... But there are many ways. As we, with viruses, right. whatever works. All roads lead to messenger RNA. As you will see later, there are some other viruses that have reverse transcriptase, but their genome does not look like this. So there are many configurations. That's not a great answer, and I've given it same one to you before. But it's okay, it's okay. okay. But this virion has two of these RNAs. And also in the virion, the RNA is coated with a protein called nucleocapsid. And that is unprecedented for a plus-strand RNA virus. None of those Un others don't need it because that RNA gets into a cell and is translated. Right. But this RNA gets into a cell. It's not translated. It's copied into DNA. Right. And to do that, it needs this protein coating it. Which gives it this little factory like. Uh, makes it a little factory, arranges things, makes the DNA more efficient. Yeah. So we have the two RNAs, we have a protein in the virion. The virions of these RNA tumor viruses, or retroviruses, by the way, are enveloped. And within the envelope is a capsid, an icosahedral capsid. Within it are the two genomes, reverse transcriptase enzyme, about 50 to 100 copies per virion. The RNA wow. is coated with nucleocapsid. And then there's one other thing we need to deal with here. Capsid is actually full of tRNAs. You're that kidding. It, it picks up from the cell as it packages. Oh, you're kidding. And we don't know what most of them do with the exception of two, which are hybridized to the two viral oh. RNAs within the virion. Vince, I love, I love this. Those are going to be primers for DNA synthesis, as you will see. In a moment. So where is all this taking place within the cell? Good question. So the virus binds to a cell surface right. receptor. It's internalized. Yep. Then the capsid within the membrane gets out into the cytoplasm, and that's where the reverse transcription begins. That capsid becomes permeolized. It becomes what's called an RT, a reverse transcribing complex, in the cytoplasm, and it starts to make DNA right there. How does the DNA then get into the host nucleus? We'll, we'll get to that. Okay. And what is the binding protein on the surface, by the way? Depends on the uh, virus. There are, mice, there are mouse retroviruses. There are human, as you know, HIV-1 is, is a human retrovirus. Of course. It binds to C, CD4 on the cell surface. Among other things. Protein. Yes, yes. So all the mouse viruses, they're ape, they're monkey, they're many different retroviruses. XMRV, the one associated mm. with prostate cancer and chronic fatigue, has another receptor. So it depends. There's quite a variety of receptors. And have we ever strategized to prevent them binding and then prevent cancer this way? Actually, it's, uh, it's been looked at for HIV. There was oh, a therapeutic sure. made to prevent binding, but it uh, wasn't good enough, didn't make it into clinical trials. Okay, okay so we have this nice uh, RNA, two RNAs, tRNA primers, Coated wow. with protein. Of host origin. Of host origin, absolutely. Incredible. And for which amino acid is that? Good question, Dick. And you know where I'm going to look for the answer? <laughs> no, where? In your book. I the bet. reverse transcriptases of all retroviruses studied to date are primed by one of only a few classes of cellular tRNAs. Most mammalian retroviral reverse transcriptases rely on either tRNA proline or lysine. <sighs> 
The others don't work. Proline or lysine. Those are not even related to each other. I, so that's bizarre. A lot of people have spent many years working on that. That's bizarre. Okay, 50 to 100 molecules of reverse transcriptase per virion. So you have this wow. picture so far? I do. What's in that virus? So let's look at what happens. Sure. So we are now, this is a part of the uh, podcast where you might want to look at the figures or we're going to post a video version of this because it really relies heavily on figures. Is that okay with you, Dick? Not a problem at all. So the, in the first figure called DNA synthesis cytoplasmic. This is what's happening as soon as the virus is in the cytoplasm. The membrane's gone. The capsid is permeabilized, so things can get in and out, particular triphosphates, which is needed by the enzyme to make Absolutely. DNA. So there's what the one, of the one copy of the viral RNA looks like. It has a five-prime cap structure, which we'll talk about in, when we talk about translation. It has a poly A at the three-prime end. Great. And it has this tRNA bound. The first thing that happens is the reverse transcriptase uses this tRNA as a primer and makes a short DNA copy, <laughs> which is called negative strand strong stop DNA. Now, this is weird because the primer is near the five prime end of the RNA. Normally, you would think the primer would prime at the three prime end and make a copy, and that's the end of it. But it has to do this in order to preserve the ends of these RNAs, nice. as you will see. So it makes this strong stop DNA. As it's doing that, the enzyme, the reverse transcriptase, has an, another activity associated with it, which is called RNASH. RNASH is an enzyme that degrades the RNA part of an RNA-DNA molecule. <laughs> so, you know, DNA is double-stranded. RNA can be double-stranded. And here, as the reverse transcriptase is making this little piece of DNA, it's a DNA-RNA hybrid. It doesn't want the RNA anymore. So the, the RT has an enzymatic activity that gets rid of it. So now we have a RNA, a viral RNA, with a little overhang. piece of DNA yes. overhang. Do you know what that overhang is going to do? It's going to serve oh, as a primer. Let me think. <laughs> it's going to serve as a primer sure. at the three prime end of the viral RNA. It's how you start DNA synthesis. And now we're going to start DNA. And it makes this little what's called a template exchange. It goes to the, it anneals to the three prime end, and it starts to copy it. And as it's copying it into a DNA copy, which is shown in blue in these pictures, it's chewing away the RNA template. The RNA SH activity of the enzyme chews away the RNA template, and it, it goes Amazing. all the way around to the. It makes a DNA copy of the whole thing, and while it's doing that, Dick, it starts something else. Mm -hmm. There is a little piece of RNA that's not digested away by the RNA SH activity. It's called PPT, polypurine. Pyrimidine rich tract, I believe it stands for. And that remains there as a primer. And then it's going to make the other strand of DNA. See, the darker blue is the plus strand because we need a double stranded DNA copy eventually, right? We do. This was all worked out in in vitro reactions. And I remember when it was being done in the uh, early 80s, I was around. It was amazing. All right, so that's so far we've got a, a almost a full length minus strand, and now a little bit of a plus strand synthesis. And then finally, this plus strand is extended and then goes back, <laughs> pushes the tRNA off, and then goes and hybridizes to the area where the tRNA was and completes synthesis of a plus strand. So that blue is going to copy on the minus DNA and make a complete strand. The RNA-SH removes the tRNA. And then those the primer binding sequence, which is where the tRNA was, that plus strong stop DNA, which is the little bit of plus stranded DNA made so far, is going to anneal to that, and then it's going to complete the synthesis of a full-length double-stranded DNA copy. That's amazing. So here's a summary of all that. Here's the plus stranded DNA being made, and it's going to go all around. And the end result is a double-stranded DNA copy of the RNA genome of retroviruses. And what it, why it has to go through all this funny business is to preserve the two ends. You notice that the ends are repeated, and these are called LTRs, or long terminal LTR repeats. repeats. Yeah, 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 and these yeah. are very important for the biology of the virus. And if this kind of weird priming and jumping didn't happen, you would lose those. So that's why this has evolved to do this, to preserve the end sequences, which are very important. So, so those, all is happening in the cytoplasm, sure. by the way. I mean, you look at the the overall strategy of, of this virus, and you wonder if in nature you can find bits and pieces of this that are employed by other replicative units that when you were, when you, like a box of Lego, 
when you put all of them together, you get one of these, but when you've only got this part of it, you've got another kind of virus. Is that true, by the way? We can find bits and pieces elsewhere, yes. I, I mean, mean, parts of these absolutely. mechanisms exist in other viral replication cycles? Yes, and parts of these enzymes are found in eukaryotic genomes. I'm going to show you a picture of that. So yeah. it, it begs the question of how did all this evolve? That's what I'm really driving at, because it, it's a very complicated pattern. Uh -huh. But it might Absolutely. be based on simple reactions that when you add one to the next, you get a more complex picture, but they're still simplistic. Yes. So that ultimately you get one of these things that can now induce now, cancer. I, I mean, it's an interesting question. Difficult to answer. Evolution of viruses is always difficult. Well, these are my open-ended questions. As because you will see, uh, there is some evidence that these viruses started out in eukaryotic genomes. That's one possibility, and then they peeled off to become viruses. You mean we are the seeds of our own destruction? Yeah. Well, that's one of the theories of the origins of viruses. Wow. They came from cells, right? They had to come from someplace. Successful systems. Attract parasites. Yeah. All right, so we have a double-stranded DNA. And I just wanted to show you a picture of the proteins that are involved in that. This mRNA is the mRNA of a retrovirus, an RNA tumor virus. And... It encodes, for the simplest retroviruses, it encodes only two proteins, GAG, which is the structural precursor, and PAL, which is the precursor to the reverse transcriptase, or polymerase, the RNA sage, and a third enzyme called integrase, which is going to be needed to put that DNA copy into the chromosome of the cell. And the, the configuration of these varies depending on whether it's a bird retrovirus, a mouse, or a human. In some cases, these proteins are separate. In some cases, they're all together with the reverse transcriptase. But the three enzymes, we've talked about the polymerase, which makes the DNA copy of the RNA, the RNA-SH, which chews away the, te the template, the RNA template, and we'll talk about the integrase next. This enzyme, by the way, looks like all the other nucleic acid polymerases that we talked about in the last Virology 101. Do you remember RNA-dependent RNA polymerase? Yep. DNA-dependent DNA and DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. They all look like a right hand. They have a palm, which is the active site. They have fingers and a thumb. And this is just like that. And in fact, on the top is the three-dimensional structure of reverse transcriptase, showing the palm and the thumb and the fingers and a template of uh, mm. RNA in there where the incoming triphosphates come. So this is all done from high-resolution X-ray crystallography, which can, from which we can tell where every amino acid, every atom is located in three right. dimensions. Right. We use computers to make these nice images. And below is... Uh, cartoon of how this works so you can see the, the fingers, the palm, the mm -hmm. thumb, and there's some uh, ions that are needed for activity. And here's the, the RNA template, which is green, and the DNA product, which is blue. And it's made on that palm surface. There's also an RNA-SH active site here, as you can see, where the RNA gets degraded. So the DNA that's produced is threaded out, and the RNA is thrown away. It's not needed anymore. Remarkable. Now, DNA synthesis, of course, I shouldn't say of course. <laughs> DNA to DNA is is error prone, but there's a correction mechanism. So most DNA polymerases, DNA dependent DNA polymerases, have a way of correcting the mistakes they make. All polymerases make mistakes. But right. RNA dependent RNA polymerases do not have correction mechanisms. That's why RNA viruses are so variable. They spawn so many mutants because the polymerases make errors. We will actually go into this in more detail when we talk about evolution of viruses. <laughs> <laughs> this is unusual because here the retroviral reverse transcriptase is error prone. It's error prone in making DNA from RNA. It doesn't have a correction mechanism. Okay, so it's the one example I know of where the DNA synthesis is very error prone. As a consequence, these viruses mutate extensively, and HIV, of course, is a huge mutator. Yeah. And it's because of this. Now, Dick, reverse transcriptase is not only found in retroviruses. It's found in hepadenoviruses, which is hepatitis B virus. Ah. We're going to talk about that. It's a DNA virus. What is a retro reverse transcriptase doing in a DNA virus? Well, I'll tell you. There's some, I'm sure you will. <laughs> there are plant viruses with DNA genomes that also have reverse transcriptase. And what people think, and this is not me, this is what yeah, I yeah. feel, is that reverse transcriptase is a bridge from the RNA world. You know this theory that at one time yeah, yeah, all yeah. life was thought to be RNA-based? Sure. And now it's DNA. So how do we get from RNA to DNA world? Exactly. Well, maybe reverse transcriptase. Huh. Now, our cells have what are called retro elements. And these are sequences related to reverse transcriptase, integrated into us. And some people think these are the original 
origins of retroviruses. We have a lot of these retro elements in our genomes and that of many, many other organisms. Mm. I want to show you a picture of those. This is amazing. You, you might not know this. These are all the different There's kinds. There's a lot of, that I don't know, Vince. <laughs> these are all the different kinds of retro elements that you can find in eukaryotic genomes. And a retro element just means it has a sequence homology to reverse transcriptase with a retrovirus genome. Wow. So some cells have endogenous retroviruses, so they have almost a full retroviral genome integrated into them. So ma mice, many strains of mice have endogenous retroviruses, and those mice often make virus, infectious virus, from that endogenous DNA copy. So endogenous means it's in the chromosome. Right. We have a lot of retroviruses. They're called HERVs human endogenous retroviruses, but they're all defective. They don't make virus mm -hmm. as far as we know. Mm -hmm. Yeast also have what are called retrotransposons. They are sequences that look like retroviral genomes. They don't make particles, but they do pop around. They can yeah. pop in and out. Jumping genes. Yes. Also, there are also other sequences in human cells, uh, retroposons, retro sequences and processed pseudogenes. These are all things that are related to retroviral genomes. As far as we know, they don't make active reverse transcriptase. They're defective, but they're there. And Dick, we have quite a few. Look at the numbers. 10,000, 100,000, a million copies of this one. That's a lot of energy we spend making something that apparently has no use. We have a huge percentage of... of Do you uh, believe that they have no use, Vince? No, I think they... Uh -huh. Currently, I don't know. Use evolutionarily, maybe, but not currently, maybe. But why would we keep something that costs a lot of energy to maintain? Well, we've only studied it for 50 years, so <laughs> what do we know? Right. Our our snapshot view is too small to make any conclusions. But if we could study it for 100,000 years, oh, if we could compare the genome of a Neanderthal we with ours. We can. We've already done that. And do, and they also have these endogenous. I don't know that detail, but I do. They know. do. I believe they do. I'm sure they do. So they've been around a long time, which but suggests they have some function. Well, that's yeah. not so long though. That's only three million. Hey, years. Dick. Last year, last week, we talked about uh, amoebae, which have the biggest genome of of all. Right. Why? Well, not the biggest genome of all. The biggest genome of all is uh, orchids. That's right. But the amoeba is bigger than human genome. Much bigger. Why? Do they need it? It's the same <laughs> question, right? It is the same question, but. But, I mean, these are non-translated units. Most of them are non-translated, yes. They're defective. As well, far as we know. You say I mean, defective. Well, the effective meaning they don't make infectious viruses. Okay. Does anything else in nature that we know is translated well, the look mouse, a little like this? The mouse endogenous retroviruses are No, no, non-viral. Non-viral. Anything else in nature? Yeah. It's not a virus. No, these are all... Viral That's constructs. That's all we have. These They're are all, all viral constructs. All viral constructs. I mean, there may be other things not related to viruses. And we I assume don't. that there's some mutant that occurred that prevented it from being replicated, and it just got stuck in our genome. We couldn't get rid of it. Um, maybe originally it could replicate, and then it died. Or maybe it's always been this way, and any viruses evolved from these by correcting the mutations? I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know the answer. Does our DNA synthetase correct these corrections? No, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm trying to find the number, the percentage of the human genome that is uh, all this retro element. Approximately 20% of the human genome. 20%? Is one of these elements. The line one is 20% of human genome sequence. Although most element line elements are dead. Uh, 80 to 100 of them are transposition competent in the human genome. That is, they can bounce around and they can cause mutation. They make you sick. <laughs> the kind that make you sick. Kind That's that right. <laughs> This, I find this fascinating. I'm sure. I mean, re, our, uh, retroviruses are great, really interesting. These are incredible. They're in our genomes and of most eukaryotes, and we don't know why, with the exception of the mouse viruses. But why would a mouse carry an infectious retrovirus? And it doesn't harm them for the most part. And, you know, these endogenous murine retroviruses are the precursors of XMRV, the prostate CFS-associated virus. So... Very interesting. Isn't this interesting? It's fascinating. Did you think you were going to be bored? I never am bored when I'm talking with you. <laughs> Ever. All right. Let's move to uh, integration. Now, this the feature. another feature of the retrovirus genome, of course, is that the DNA copy goes into your chromosome. Right. There's a viral enzyme that does that. It's carried in with the particle. It's called integrase. It takes the double-stranded DNA, and it sticks it into host DNA. Right. And in doing so, you end up getting a piece of the whole genome of the retrovirus integrated into host DNA. And all you do is you lose two bases at each end of the 
retrovirus DNA that's important, that's needed to integrate. Mm. Now, that is essential in the life cycle because once that DNA is in there, then the host DNA-dependent RNA polymerase makes messenger RNA from it. There is a promoter sequence that is a sequence where RNA synthesis initiates in the LTR of the retroviral DNA. You make the mRNA, and from that all the viral proteins are made, and you can make new virions. <laughs> so the virus is co-opting the RNA polymerase of the cell to make its messages. And this DNA always stays in the genome. It doesn't need to go anywhere else. It's done. Okay. Are, are any viral RNAs edited? Yes. Yes, oh, measles virus, other paramyxovirus RNAs, okay. they, they, there are non-templated changes are made okay. during transcription. I'm just curious about that. This uh, integration event is very interesting. It's been studied extensively. It's, as I said, the integrase protein carries it out. It's, it's fascinating. You have a retroviral DNA, which is double-stranded, and the ends uh, invade the host DNA, and, <laughs> and it nicks the host DNA forms a covalent bond. So you break two bonds in the host DNA, and the energy you release by breaking those goes into forming a new bond with the viral DNA. Mm. And eventually you get two uh, double-stranded joints at each end, and now this DNA of the virus is part of the host cell. And then it's called a provirus. Uh -huh. So the name for the integrated RNA tumor virus DNA in the host cell is a provirus. And there's when it makes messenger RNA and all the proteins to make new viruses. Now, the integrase is the target of a antiviral against HIV, as is the reverse transcriptase, of course. But Does viral target. synthesis for new viral particles occur in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm? mRNAs are made in the nucleus, and those are transported. Transported out, and then now, the whole show is outside. The whole show is in all the proteins. The reverse transcriptase is made in the cytoplasm, all the capsid proteins, and the glycoproteins in the surface of the virion. And, you so, know, we're going to talk about that during assembly. Okay. I promise. I'm sure. So I was just curious it. because I, I've seen some electromicrographs where you've got almost a crystalline-like structure for the viral particle synthesis. Absolutely. And some of those are in the nucleus and some of those are not in the nucleus. So this virus assembles, well, this, this virus, the retroviruses assemble at the plasma membrane. They butt out. Okay. As does Sure, influenza. of course, HIV, of course. So we're going course, to talk about of course. that. Now, I thought you might ask me, where do these retroviral DNAs integrate? Vince, where do these viral <laughs> RNAs... Do they have a preferred site? Yes, do they? They don't. They go pretty randomly. And the people have looked at this, and this table I'm showing Dick shows that depending on the retrovirus, they can go in genes, encoding regions, or they can go in transcription start sites. It seems to be pretty random. There's no one place that these like to go. They can go everywhere. If they go inside of a gene, though, what happens to that gene? Oh, it gets disrupted, doesn't it? And There's another copy, a, though, isn't there? There is another copy, yes. But uh, if both copies were disrupted, that would be a problem. Well, that's my it? other question, then. Do you have both strands of the DNA molecule? That's the host DNA. Is that equally invaded? No, it's only one. Only one? It's just one, yeah. It doesn't go in twice like that, no. I mean, you can have multiple integrations during an infection, but... No, but in both strands, you, you won't get multiple integrations both in both strands. Both strands, right, but that's just one allele, right? But never in the same place in the double strands to no, batch up. No, it's not going to go in the same place on both copies. That's very rare. And but you can you'd have... You'd kill the host then, wouldn't you? Would you? Kill, well, if the gene is essential, you could. And there are ways, there are genetic ways that you can get a disruption repeated in the other allele, but we're not right. going to talk about those. But mm -hmm. there is some mutagenesis caused by these viruses by integrating in the, in the wrong place, absolutely. And I, I wanted to show you this picture of the integration because it's beautiful. The integrase <laughs> is actually a multimer, and it cradles both the host DNA and the viral DNA in the active site so that these nicks and rejoinings can occur. Isn't that beautiful? And these have all been solved at, at high resolution, so we know these structures of these proteins. Now, you wanted to know how all this gets into the nucleus. and I did want to know that. So here's a summary of that. The virus binds its receptor. The membrane fuses and the capsid goes inside. It gets permeabilized. Reverse transcription occurs in the cytoplasm. You get a DNA copy. And that whole thing moves into the nucleus. The entire complex moves in. Yeah. Now, how does that work out with regards to the size of the well, nuclear it gets, pore? It's okay. It can get through the pore. It can get through but the pore. It, and, Depending on the retrovirus, some retroviruses it will only get in in dividing cells where the pores are opening ah, right, up. Right, 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 right. So there are many non-dividing cells. Most of them are not 
Most of the retroviruses don't infect those, with the ex ex exception of HIV, which will infect non-dividing cells. So somehow it can get its genome in when the pores are closed, and we don't know how it does that. But that double-stranded DNA goes in the nucleus as a big complex and then uh, integrates. And we I don't know if uh, our readers know much about chromosomal structure. I certainly don't. But <clears throat> chromosomal DNA is all wrapped up. It's wrapped like around these structures called nucleosomes. And the integration tends to prefer the exposed area on the really? nucleosome. Really? Maybe because it's exposed and that's all there is to it. But <laughs> it involves a whole bunch of cell proteins which are shown on this picture, but are not important for us to talk about. And many people are under, trying to understand this process because maybe you could inhibit it if you knew more about it. So we do have an integrase inhibitor, sure. but we, we could use more. Always the case, you could use more antivirals than you have. Now, I want to talk about just two other viruses briefly that have reverse transcriptase, and one of them is hepatitis B virus, which is a virus that infects your liver. It's a human pathogen. But it's a cancer-causing virus. And it causes cancer, absolutely. And this has a double-stranded DNA genome, which is the weirdest genome I've seen because it's not completely double-stranded. It's got a gap, and it's got a piece of RNA stuck on it. And all that is the result of the replication process. This virus encodes a reverse transcriptase, and that's the enzyme that makes this genome from an RNA. So this genome is made into RNA in the cell, and then the RNA is made into DNA again. And studying this genome, by the way, resulted in a Nobel Prize for one of our graduates, Baruch Blumberg. That's right. <laughs> Baruch Blumberg. That's right. He discovered the particles yeah, and the particles. said they that's were a right. virus. That's, that's right. correct. All right. So here's a very quick summary of the hepatitis B replication cycle. The virus binds to a receptor, gets in the cell. Yep. The DNA goes into the nucleus. Uh -huh. It's repaired and right. made into a nice double-stranded DNA. And then that's copied to form RNA. The RNA goes in the cytoplasm, starts to be translated, assembled into a particle, and then one of those proteins translated from the RNA is reverse transcriptase. It makes the DNA copy, and that's what's in the particle that's then released. I don't know why this virus would do that. It's already a DNA virus. Why does it need to? It's the way it's evolved. But this is very cool. Another virus with reverse transcriptase. And I just want to show that there is homology between the reverse transcriptase of hepatitis B viruses and HIV or other retroviruses. Right. So they must have a common ancestor, I guess? One would assume. So lastly, there is another group of viruses, and these are plant viruses, Dick, cauliflower mosaic virus. They have reverse transcriptase. They don't cause tumors in plants, but they have reverse transcriptase. A similar replication process as the hepadenoviruses, the hepatitis B virus, they have right. a DNA genome, and in, in the cell it's converted from a funny nicked and incomplete DNA into a closed circular double-stranded DNA. It's made into an RNA, and then one of the proteins translated from that is reverse transcriptase, which makes a DNA copy, which ends up being packaged in viral particles. Isn't that cool? Very. And one more, foamy retroviruses. They have RNA genomes but they also have DNA genomes. They package both, and the DNA is infectious, and they have reverse transcriptase. We don't really understand them. They don't cause any known disease, really? but they have a very unusual lifestyle, and I think in some future episode we'll find someone who... Where are they from? That is, what organism did you isolate them from? Monkeys. Monkeys. Simian foamy viruses. New world or old world monkeys? Mm -hmm. i got to look it up, Dick. <laughs> that's why we keep books in our shelves. Yeah, you can't keep it all in your head, can you? I can't. That's very, Oh, I can keep it there, but it gets it keeps getting mixed up. I always say, I know where to find the answer if I right. don't know it. And that's, that's probably right. a good part of the battle. I need to know their phone numbers. <laughs> a phone? What's a phone? That's right. Foamy viruses. Here we go. I have foamy. a nice, nice picture here of a foamy virus. Spumavirinae, a subfamily of retroviruses isolated from primate, feline, and bovine species. That's all I can tell you at the moment. I don't right. know if it's old or new world. Okay. And I believe that ends the pictures. And wow. that ends our little session on reverse transcription. And, of course, we do. I, I selected some emails. Wait, wait. Before we leave that subject. Yes. Are there, are there lots of drugs that work against that enzyme? Because it yes. seems to be specific yeah, to all the viruses. Reverse transcriptase, there are many, many drugs specific for the HIV reverse transcriptase, both that inhibit 
both that inhibit at the active site and somewhere else. So they're the nucleoside analogs like AZT, and then they're non-nucleoside analogs. And there's also an inhibitor of integrase, which is also part of that enzyme. Right. And that's why we're so successful in treating HIV, because we have so many different antivirals that exactly. target it. So there's, a, there's another organelle in your body that's got its own genome namely the mitochondrion. And some of these antiretroviral agents also interfere with mitochondrial functioning, I'm told, because they have their own replication cycle. It almost looks like it's another virus replicating inside your, your cells. Yeah, so it's probably some of the nucleoside inhibitors or analogs would be also inhibiting those polymerases. They're not entirely specific for the exactly, virus. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Which is one of the side effects of being treated for HIV. Yeah, yeah. You lose energy and eventually... You lose your mitochondria. Yes, there are side effects. I was just listening to a podcast about that this morning. Yes, but gotcha. lots of drugs targeted against these, the RT and the integrase, because it's an important disease. Of and a lot of effort has gone into dis discovering drugs. And you could do similar discovery for most viruses. Sure. Uh, if you had the ability to diagnose them. With HIV, we have a lot of time to diagnose the infection, and it's not over anytime soon. So you have mm -hmm. time to treat. It's a chronic infection. I, th I picked a few emails that were related to this topic. Oh, good. Okay? Here's one from Phil. Dear Vincent and Dick, I am a French virologist trained at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, ah. now working for Swiss Prot in Geneva, Switzerland, where I take care of Viral Zone web resources. And that was actually one of our picks of the week. Viral Zone, great website, mm. all things about sequences and structures of viruses. It's a database. First, thank you very much for your great podcast. I love it. It is so captivating that it makes me sometimes miss my bus station, <laughs> actually giving an extra quiet time for more listening. Thank you. I would like to have your opinion on a simple question. What should be considered as a virus entity? Is it the vegetative virion or the infected cell? Hmm. Got any ideas about that? Thing? Which is the virus? The virus? Or you can't have a viral particle unless the cell made it. Mm -hmm. So I think that a virus particle never really is separated from its cell type until it bursts open and goes to the next cell, right? Yeah. It's not, uh, it, in other words, I know that the retroviruses, uh, at least the ones that I'm familiar with, the HIV, cannot be transferred as a particle. It has to go in, in a living cell. So in that point, you must consider the thing as a complex the host and the virus together constitutes the infectious unit because apart from the host cell, it's not infectious. What about for all the most other situations where the virus is infectious? Well, that's right. I mean... So but, I think the embodiment of the virus, the, the virus is expressed in the cell, but the, the virus itself... For most virus particles, they can exist apart from the host cell for long periods of time in nature. Right. That's the virus entity. The virus entity is nothing more than a carrier of genetic information. Correct. And I asked my friend Lynn Enquist, a professor of virology at Princeton. Uh -huh. He said, good question. Gets right to the heart. Yep. Virions are not alive, but the infected cell is where the viral genome is expressed. When right. we talk about viruses doing things, we are talking about the infected cell. Yep. The analogy is a CD or a tape. <laughs> a CD or tape is nothing on its own. Plastic, uninteresting plastic. But you put the CD or the tape in the appropriate player and you will hear music or a lecture or whatever was recorded. Neither the CD or the player is capable of making music or lectures on their own. But Good together, example. they make something unique. Perfect. So I don't think you. we have an answer for you. <laughs> the virus entity is the virus particle carrying the genome. It doesn't do anything right. of any sort until it gets into a cell. Correct. So if you want to know what's the virion, it's the virus particle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cell is where it all happens. Interesting question. Nicholas writes, Hello, my name is Nicholas, and I'm a biology graduate student at Old Dominion. I was wondering if bacteriophages such as T4 are able to infect eukaryotic cells. If not, what mechanisms allow phages to invade prokaryotic cells but not eukaryotic cells? Well, they're specific for their host species. So the T4 phages involve the bacterial cell wall, so right. there must be attachment molecules that allows that to occur, which we don't have on our cell surfaces, and therefore we're not susceptible to infection. Right. Yes. Yeah, so the, in the terms of the phage, they attach to a protein that's on the surface of bacteria, but not eukaryotic cells. Correct. For some, some, some people have expressed, for example, the receptor for phage lambda, which is mol G, I think. It's a surface protein of 
bacteria. They've, you can express that in the, in the plasma membrane of a eukaryotic cell. The virus will bind, but it doesn't do anything else. No, there's... Because it's not adapted to inject The molecular DNA. ecology is wrong. That's right. Uh, Ariel and ILA write, Hello, Professor Vincent and other TWIVs. You're the other TWIV. <laughs> I listened with great interest to the last TWIV recorded with high school students, as I myself... I'm a biology and science teacher in high school, and it's great to listen to other teaching and trying to simplify its its knowledge. One of the questions and answers was not clear to me. You talked about our genome and the claim that it's made of 95% chimp and 5% remains of ancient viruses. I guess you mean retroviruses, retrovirus-related sequences, right? Endogenous retroviruses, these, these retro elements that we just talked about. Right. Can the modern retrovirus integrate into the germline cells, and can they pass it to the offspring or even reinfect the offspring from the latent integrated provirus? There's there's one known example of that in koalas in Australia. If you remember a long time ago on TWIV, we talked about that. Go look back. I can't remember the episode at the moment. Koala, a retrovirus is, uh, is invading the koala genome at the moment, in the germline in particular. So we can study that in real time. I don't know any other example of whether it, when it's happening right now, but it could. This is happening with the koala. I don't know when it went in. It may not be modern in the sense of today. It could have happened many, many years ago, and it's being spread to other chimps. But yes, you also claim that such viruses might also add features that separate the human and chimps. I know that some viruses can cause cancer via the oncogenes they carry with them. Is it possible that they could carry more genes? I don't know of any. I don't see why not. We can easily detect oncogenes, um, but as far as we know, the retroviruses have a fixed genome, and um, I don't think they pick up genes other than oncogenes that we know of. I could be wrong about that. P.S. Inspired by your post, are you receiving the influenza 2009 vaccine? I published a similar survey on my blog in Hebrew. There are still few responses, but the tendency is against immunization. I plan to publish the different posts about the vaccine and try to influence the opinion of my readers and convince them it should have great benefit to their society and only minor side effects. And then uh, they ask, a friend of mine, a teacher in my school, said he knows a Israeli freelancer scientist that is developing a chemi-biological way to remove integrated retrovirus from the DNA. Do you know anything about it? Does it work? <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I don't. I can't imagine that you could get it to work because you have to find where the retrovirus is in the genome and excise it. But if you could give us more detail, we could uh, give you an answer. I, I have not heard it, and I don't think it's possible. This is a big issue with HIV-infected people. You can live a long time on antivirals, right. but you still have the genome in you, and you, you can't bet. get rid of it. Nope. And that's what people are trying to do, and I don't know any solution. Swiss Compass writes, congratulations on some of you becoming twippers. My humble suggestion for a pick of the week is the stunning animation and detail of a YouTube video called Flu Attack, How a Virus Invades Your Body. Mm -hmm. Robert Krolwich and medical animator David Belinsky explain how flu can trick a single cell into making a million more viruses. And yes, we have actually, um, I've actually posted that at my blog. It's a great video. Right. P.S. Love the title to TWIV56, Perspicuously Perspicacious, which is how he signed his email that time. And this time he signs it Revelrous Revelry. And the last one is from Etienne. Hello, Vincent and Dick. I was listening to TWIV60, and I had a question. Since many viruses have an RNA-based genome, has anyone found or looked for enzymatic activity, even if very limited, in that RNA? It's already well known that the enzymatic action of the ribosome is generated by RNA molecules. That's right. Since enzymatic activities are well within RNA molecules' capability, it seems possible for a virus to use them in that way. Also, it would make sense that under the RNA world hypothesis for a virus to have one point, if not now, had the capability. It seems that finding enzymatic RNA in the virus would help strengthen that hypothesis quite a bit. P.S. Great show. I don't know of any enzymatic uh, RNA-based activity in a virus, but there are RNAs that can do things on their own. Self-cleaving RNAs, self-excising introns, hammerhead RNAs, which are catalytic RNAs that can cleave themselves. So they're Quite a few examples of that. Uh, they are not in the virus world, but they are in other organisms. Mm -hmm. So those might be bridges. I have a pick of the week this week. So do I. You got? You want to do that one for TWIV? Um, nope. I'll save it for TWIP. All right. So you don't have a TWIV pick, huh? No, I specialize now in my picks. No, you're only doing <laughs> TWIPs. You're going to get hate email, you know. Oh, I hope not. Anyway, I have a pick which is relevant to this um, Virology 101 on reverse transcriptase. It's the 
joint UN program on HIV AIDS website. It's UN AIDS, mm -hmm. which is a great website. Have you ever been there, Dick? I've been to the um, WHO website. This is different. This is specific for HIV AIDS. It's just full of information about policy and practice, country responses, correspondence, co-sponsors, partnerships, knowledge center. Mm. They have great data on the current status of what's going on. Here's a report on the global AIDS epidemic. Right. They have uh, media kits, wall charts, tables. Apparently now, in the past year, the, the infection rate has gone down significantly, which is good. Anyway, it's a great site for all information possible on HIV AIDS. And so in a lecture on reverse transcriptase, I thought that was appropriate. Here, here. No, no picks, you sure? Um, pretty sure. All right. Well, you have time next month to think of a lot of picks. I do, but fishing. we're going to do a TWIP for that time period, too. Yes, we are, and you can have your pick on TWIP. We can. Well, if you're a new listener to TWIV, tell your friends if you like it. Get them to subscribe in iTunes. It's free. And you can automatically get each new episode. We are also available at the Zoom Marketplace if you have a Zoom. And if you don't have an audio player, you can go to our website, twiv.tv. You can listen to the episode there or download it to play on your computer. Twiv's part of microbeworld.org, a community made by ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, to help disseminate information about microbes. You can also find Twiv at sciencepodcasters.org and promednetwork.com, websites where you can find high-quality science podcasts from a wide variety of fields. Do go to our website, twiv.tv, where you can find show notes and links to the stories that we talk about. In today's episode, we'll have some of the images that we used and a video so you can watch and listen at the same time. Don't forget to check out TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, at microworld.org slash TWIP. Always send us your questions and comments, twiv at twiv.tv. You can send us a note, you can send us an MP3 file, or you can call us up on Skype and leave a message at Twiv Podcast. Dick? Vince? Thanks as usual. Medicalecology.org? Trichinella.org? Yep. Was it a pleasure? Did you learn? I learned a great deal. And so did I. In teaching, one learns, you know. Indeed. I just wish I didn't forget so much. <laughs> oh, that's all right. We'll remind you. I'll, I'll go back over the TWIVs, and I can review now 101 all the way up to the present. We have a lot of TWIVs. We do. We're approaching 100. I think we're going to hit 100 in 2010. Hmm? You know, this seems like it was just yesterday that we started this. It does. I'm not kidding. I mean, I know we've discussed my, uh, my uh, retirement, and having started 38 years ago here, Thinking about when I first started and how I felt and, and knowing where I am today, it's absolutely a fast-forward life that we live, no matter how slow we take our time mm. to do things. In retrospect, everything is speeded up because of all of the introns have been removed. <laughs> in retrospect, it is all speeded up and very clear. Exactly. And, you know, it's amazing. It's it's quite amazing, actually. So to know that we're approaching the 100th TWIV is just mind-boggling. Yeah, it's amazing. I We have to thank everyone for listening, because if no one listened, we wouldn't do it. All true. So thank everyone for listening. You have been listening, of course, to This Week in Virology, TWIV, this podcast all about viruses. We will see you next week. Another TWIV is viral. Mm -hmm.